Yes, Eve, it's great to have you uh, to chat about user-centered design or human-centered design. Just to, to kick off the program, a little bit about yourself. In full disclosure, you and I worked together at CWDS, mm -hmm. uh, where I was communications, yeah. and you were the design director. So it's been a couple months since I've seen you, but it's great yeah. to see you. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Um, yeah, a, a, a few bits about me here. Um, I think, um, and I say this humbly and I think I was California's first design director, um, and I say that as part of a movement at the state and then also federal level of bringing user-centered design, agile practice, and like product thinking in, into government. So yeah, I was at California Child Welfare at Digital Services about a year and a half, um, working on, on that project and, and the, the up to 12 designers at the end of that. And before that, I was at 18F, F is in Frank, um, so you can hear it. Uh, and at 18F, was there about two and a half years and working a lot on consulting and strategy work in the government um, of how different agencies might even start to think about improving their systems from the higher up point of view. And then also using user-centered design practices to show early value. To get started, what you know, what is user-centered design? Why do, why do we care about it? Why, why do they you know have it with uh, in in an IT project or a software development project? Sure, sure. Quick thing on uh, abbreviations: user-centered design. UCD, human centered design, HCD, design thinking, these all are very similar spaces, and so sometimes you, you'll find people using the words interchangeably. First of all, it's not rocket science. I do want to say this. Like, it's it's a type of pragmatic thinking that with other methods that make it actionable, and I'm about to describe it in a second. I just want to call that out because in government, in my experiences, I've run into folks in all levels of government that have a, that type of pragmatism that is, is useful to the project. Um, but basically, it's about really understanding user needs and not wants, um, and needs not just in the, and I'm using, I'm speaking all of this in a government context, by the way, but not just like user needs as in like business process, but uh, like user opportunities so that folks either um, working on behalf of the government and, and using products and services or those interacting with it, um, that there's opportunities for them to kind of thrive on the experience. And that's not just like, um, you know, compliance laws or, you know, the, the basic steps of a process. So user-centered design is, is a thing of like, a discovery is often a term used. Um, to understand, um, again, to differentiate between, to discover needs and wants, but to, to especially focus on needs, um, and also building empathy, and in that are opportunities for that. Um, and a lot of the work I've done, it's to help um, understand how folks are working with existing systems that are going to be quote-unquote modernized is a term that we've used. And that kind of thinking, there's a bunch of methods for that. There's methods to discover it. There's methods that, to synthesize that into like insights that then can be acted on. And often, I would say, often folks think it's just about discovering user needs, but synthesizing that into an actionable strategy plan matters next, because then, especially in, a, say, a, a software or a digital services context, how those are prioritized and articulated helps make technical and product decisions as well. So this, within each of those buckets are all sorts of different techniques you can use, and um, depending on your job, different questions you can be asking of designers, um, or designers might be asking of you at that. Is it too simplistic to say that user-centered design is is really just so that you you develop a, a new system, for example, mm -hmm. and and it fits the user's needs? You know, it's it's so you don't have to do it twice, or you know, you don't get it wrong the first time. No, it's it's not unreasonable to say that. Uh, I often is uh, efficacy, safety, and impact in a government setting. Really, and if you build for user-centered needs, it's not just like oh, so they like it better, and isn't that nice? Like I say this for like all strata of government that's wondering why to invest the time or in these processes. Um, but it, it, it gets, it's going to make the, the product or the business service or the, the whatever the mission is promised to the people from a government point of view better. It's going to identify safety risks and mitigate them earlier, um, and it can have a better impact on whatever mission, whether it's like um, from child welfare, like ch children getting put to a safe home, or the DMV and you're trying to like register your car. Mm -hmm. So I, I do say that when people ask, like, well, why bother? What's their real value? It's really important to to take it the, the, the pleasingness, the surface of like, oh, someone's happier, um, and translate into what that really me means in, into an experience. At, at the beginning of every one of your projects, I'm sure you sit down with executives and sort of explain your value or your, your strategy. What's your pitch? You know, what's the main point that you want to leave with uh, executives that are like running a project, for example, what, how do you get started? 
Oh, there's so much in that question, right? I want to understand the problem space, and then to get a little meta, I want to under- get a better understanding of their perception of the problem space and past work around it to help determine kind of like some diagnostics to understand where to go next with that. I definitely want to, what I'm often, and I'm talking about this all the time, which is like understanding the, the value space. And there's a lot of work, words lately, and, and there's been a lot of articles and talk lately about value-driven design and not just human-centered design. Erica Hall just wrote a post on Medium that people are talking about, like what happens, and you look at it from that point of view as well. And I say value because there might be shifting ways to meet that, but if you keep that in mind, then you, you don't lose sight of like the, the space that you're in. Um, and then the other thing is looking at, and this goes also into like product strategy and actually agile practices as well, but how do you slice off chunks to either experiment on um, or deliver value with? Because things can get big really fast in a government space. Policy making, compliance, um, budgeting cycle, these are things that in either highly regulated private industry or government like are also part of the course. So it's like... How do you like navigate a path through all these different things to deliver value for whichever users you've identified? In terms of you know feedback mm-hmm. and the, the feedback loop, uh, that's something that you and I used to talk about a lot on the project. Is mm-hmm. you know what's the the users give you feedback? They tell mm-hmm. you how it how it works well or how it doesn't work well. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that the user feedback loop in relation to agile? I mean, how, how are they? How do they go together? Great question. Like, from the big point of view, like, the design process and cycle, and there are different ones. It's not like the, I don't think concrete people have different ways depending on the, the size or scope of the problem. But there's always discovery, right? And you always want a certain type of discovery at the beginning to really set the foundation for moving forward. But throughout that are also other buckets of discovery. Um, and how those fit in with, like, you know, agile software cadences of one or two weeks. You know, th- there's often some tension that comes there. I often, I often call it the creative tension if all parties um, are attentive to that. But so there's, there's the things like discovery is really like understanding the, the problem space, the policy, policy space. Discovery can also be technical discovery areas if you're looking at existing technical systems that you have to integrate it with or build on top of or replace. And and then there's user discovery of like like overall like what's the overall like you know zeitgeist or gestalt of the person you know like what are their pain points what are, what do they strive for um, what are their strengths I think that's often overlooked in research because we're always focusing on on the negative in a sense to mitigate that but during the agile process like then you then you have a sense of what you're, what you how you want to begin to move forward and we often hear the term MVP minimal viable product and. So you start to do these slices, and you learn, the, the thing that, that's really important is you learn so much from that as well, and you learn some things about, you know, the, we often hear the term usability, and usability is often like, you know, does the whole, like, all the features and pieces together, is it still usable? Because you're often thinking of different parts, you know, and, and the usability using actual data in a, in, a, in a realistic live situation, there's value from that. But I want to say that's separate from understanding, like, the big picture need finding that goes into, like, the overall, like, information architecture, the overall, like, mental concept of, of what this application is, or is it um, how big should a, should a piece of technology fit in a user flow? Um, and I'm saying that because that quickly becomes a discussion about service design. You know, there's, like, software and digital services, but service design is the whole aspect of how we deliver on that, and sometimes it's technical, sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes the real wins might be a business process improvement and not even around about code. You know, we make assumptions on that. Um, so they're intertwined. There's a beautiful stability to software engineering on an agile cadence as researchers and designers, as long as like, we and the teams I work with have the time to do more holistic thinking, but knowing that the engineers are committed to that type of thing, you can work with that. And, and you know, from an engineering point of view, there's like no empty backlog. I'm putting quotes around that, um, you know, because that's like an engineering no no. Like you you want to have you know a, a week or two weeks or a month out, depending. You don't need more than that in many respects. Um, and as long as design might have to do bigger picture thinking, but as long as that it feeds back into the slices that fill the backlog. So, okay, well, I, I asked the, um, you know, what's good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, so here's the flip side. Yeah. What are the danger zones? What do you try to avoid? 
Absolutely, 100,000%. Avoiding setting up projects where designers and researchers um, or people filling those roles do not have enough time to get on the ground and do that type of big D discovery research before engineering shows up. So before engineering shows up with the expectation of building software. Mm -hmm. Because I actually am all for engineering being, or engineers being part of a discovery team. You know, there are... There are engineers I've worked with that have a very strong research and usability sense and come do research with us because you're going to have it from a certain technical point of view. Um, so that's my number one thing is don't start, don't start projects that, you know, right, stacked right on each other. In two weeks is, an, is usually not enough in a government setting because there's relationship building with stakeholders, there's policy, um, government projects. You know, there could be, like, tens of years of previous efforts to do something in this area. And so there's a lot of, like, emotional work on the ground as well. So don't stack them out on top of each other. You know, conversely, don't separate them so much so that you lose the insights. You want them to come together as one team. Or sure. Sure. Yeah. Any, um, any specific examples you'd like to talk about in terms of, you know, recent projects? Yeah, sure, sure. Examples of the good I'm going to pull off um, at 18F, and this was after my time there, they started doing... And I believe they're still doing it's a type of strategy work, and they call it pathfinding and not discovery, which I think is a really respectful, responsive term. Because in government, you know, often on projects, there's been years of analysis on something and it hasn't moved forward. So it's like respecting, it's not like discovering what the problem was, it's maybe looking at it in a different way. And so they use this term pathfinding, like navigating through how you might move forward and then move on and hire a team and either do deeper research or bring on a, a, an engineering team or, or procuring it, right? Um, so I'm, I'm intrigued by like, what they're doing with that space. Um, and there's been a handful of projects in the federal space where we did some discovery. Um, Department of Labor project I worked on, we did a three-day workshop, and we just did prototyping um, improved business processes, so that wasn't technical, and they had things that they could act on. And then, like, prototyping, you know, moving a paper form to digital, because that often is, is a good thing to do for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, at CWDS, um, things tended to get stacked of design versus engineering starting around the same time. And, you know, that goes right up to procurement, and the challenge is still in procurement. And if how do you write a contract that may take a long time to get approved and go through, and for small and medium, like really skilled small and medium agencies... And, and vendors is often the term used, but how they can have their staff ready because that's a long ask with, you know, like government's like, we're going to take, you know, X months to approve this and then you're supposed to start in a week, right? And so that's a, that's a challenge between small and large companies. So, yeah, CWDS definitely struggled with that. I do like where they started to move and some of the work I was doing before I moved on was to make a, you know, everything has pros and cons, but to make a calculated choice to move to a centralized or semi-centralized design team um, because then they could, as a mass, like cover some of those gaps of discovery that were going to be coming up because mm -hmm. it's, there's already a, a large number of engineers on the floor. So. What, you know, what would you tell a new designer mm -hmm. um, who's coming into the government space um, who, you know, is just getting started on the job? Ooh. Like so much, so much to share. Specifically to government, to be aware of policy and compliance as part of the needs of your cross-functional team, and that there's users and users' needs, but there's like, and I don't like the word business need. That is a government term, and I respect like where it came from, but but it is. There are like promises encoded in law that the government has made, or the agency or the group you're in, and to understand that, to understand policy of what things might be policy levers to plan on within weeks or months or years that might need to change or not, if you can. And I will say this too: many government projects, if it's if it's a uh, working on a pre-existing system and you're trying to improve it. There's often, like, outdated processes of how to do things and inc incredible creative workarounds that users have done in the field. I, for me, I just want to clarify, I think of users because of so much of my work as government workers trying to use systems to serve the public, so that's, that's the angle I'm talking about. And no amount of, like, business process analysis and diagramming of as-is and to be systems, these are language I'm using in government now, will capture, like, the type of spreadsheet or post-its that someone uses in their cubicle to deal with a system that isn't quite meeting their needs. And that's the kind of thinking you want to see so you can build it into your product and then serve it back to the whole community. 
Yeah, workarounds are a really interesting one. It's not just one, clearly. Um, pain points is another point I want to bring up, which is like in, in older government systems and you do research around pain points, like you're going to find a lot and a good percentage of them or a percentage of them are going to be, and I'm putting quotes around this, fixed for free when you bring modern design practices to that. Um, and so I listen for, and I encourage like the folks on my team to listen for the pain points that are more sy- systems-wise and systemic, and not like, oh, the text box is something. Because like, well, that text box was designed 20 years ago. I'm pretty sure it'll be covered as we, you know, rake through and, and try to improve things. That'll be fine. But what's the what's the work-based or the culture-based thing? Um, and then the flip side of this, again, because research can kind of, I feel like it can kind of get negative in that sense of finding the problems, is it's very interesting to ask someone you're interviewing what are the strengths, um, because you can build on that, too. It's like, I may not be able to fix all of these things, but if I can give this, and I'm thinking of, like, this social worker, this caseworker, a moment of celebration, because they spent all day, you know, in a highly charged environment trying to do things, like, that's that's a win, too. Um, Last question. Yeah. Um, Describe an aha moment you had with a client, an executive on a project somewhere along the way, you know, researching, looking for creative solutions, and you were able to present it, and they just got it, and it was a, it was a great moment. Um, I will bring this up because I actually think about it a lot. The work I did at the federal space, I think about every day. I really do, and there are people I met there I think of every, every day, and I think of projects that could have, should have moved forward, and again, it was procurement holding it back, or some last-minute budget snafu when everyone is ready. And from that, I mentioned earlier in, in this in this discussion, this workshop I did for Department of Labor, Wage and Hour Division. Um, the acronyms, they go down, there's more, but we'll keep it simple there. And it was three days, and there were two aha moments. It was, it was this aha moment um, of policy folks based in D.C. meeting... Um, government workers based out of Chicago that had flown in for this workshop. Um, they had never met in his face, his face before. It was a, a series of, you know, emails and phone calls over the years, and that was it. And the policy folks, you know, made decisions that affected how people on the ground processed applications for this one thing, you know, and improved it or disapproved it. And they were in the room together brainstorming solutions. So within, like, 30 seconds, the policy person would be like, yeah, that's good enough. That's within compliance. That's not a risk. And they can make decisions of how they might change how they, you know, assess risk for for low-risk cases in this instance. Um, And then the other other aha moment was the executive, you know, um, supporting this and and, and providing the budget for this workshop to even happen. You know, she, of course, couldn't, wasn't going to be there the whole four, three days and came in and out. And at the end, she watched a share row, and, and, and she was convinced on the spot. And she was like, what else can we do to keep working this way? I've never seen my team be able to collaborate like this before. Um, so I really feel like it's design and government quickly becomes like design and research, and it's so much about experience design of of how teams work together and how you look at problems. So that goes into the, you know, how people use the phrase design thinking. Um, and yes, it, it is often about a UI or an endpoint and the things that we assume are design, but it's so much of like designing how people problem solve together. So. Great. Well, Jesse, thanks so much for your time. I, I hope we can do this again. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely.